One thing that I see with most all of my students uh, that you know are beginning to study with me is they have bad posture. So they uh, look down like this all the time. And if they're looking at the music, they'll look down like this and they'll bend their neck instead of doing this and just move, moving their eyes. So it's a little bit strange, but your eyes do move and you can move them without bending your neck down. That especially goes if you're playing marimba, which is a big one for your neck and you're really tall. I've had some students that are almost seven feet tall, 6'11". I've had several of those. You need to bring that marimba up. Now, luckily, marimba manufacturers make marimbas now that you can raise, like Marimba One and Adams and all these companies. All of them do. When I was growing up, though, basically you had Deegan and Musser marimbas. None of them raised up, so we would put them on blocks. Now, I'm a pretty short guy. I'm 5'7", so I, didn't, I never needed the blocks. But everybody else, you know, you put them on stack 2x4s, and then you put lift the marimba up on there, and that was great. Okay? But you need to have that marimba at a certain height. And my rule is for the drum and marimba is navel height. So you can see that that's where your belly button is pretty much. All right. Now I tend to play a little bit higher for my snare drum. Like, so when I'm playing traditional, you see here that I want my arm to be almost a perfect L like this. So it's not down, it's not up. And by the way, that's the way you, you should sit as well. We'll get to that. Okay. So when I'm playing, we come in symmetrically if you're playing traditional like this now one way to figure that out is you can use a carpenter's square which is actually a triangle okay that's what they you know they call things when they measure and you you do a 45 degree angle and you can check your angle okay so if you're like this that's going to be too much that would be like you know 65 degrees if you're like this that's too close if your arms are too close to your body that's not good either what you want is closer to a 45 degree angle, anywhere from 40 to 50 degrees, depending on your body shape, is good. So you can buy one of those carpenter square, which again, looks like a triangle, and put that in there and use that. And I used to use that, and I do sometimes, with students to show them uh, what's correct. So that angle is important, as well as the height. So your height and your angle are really important. Now you might say, why is that important? That's important because if you're off in any of those things, you're gonna strain your upper body. Your arms need to be really, really relaxed so there's no tension. And a lot of people who have these problems will get problems with their neck from looking down, like I said before, but also from doing that. When you do that, you're creating strain on your shoulder. All this connects up to your spine and to your neck area. And there's lots and lots of drummers with neck problems, lots, okay? Now, all of us from time to time will wake up with a stiff neck. You sleep bad, you know, you strain a muscle playing sports, whatever, you know? I do a lot of carpentry. Uh, I used to do a lot more. I have built a couple houses and recording studios and whatnot. And I would always hurt myself doing that, you know, lifting nail guns being a klutz and falling off of ladders. <laughs> uh, once I almost fell off a roof halfway, you know, so, you know, just being clumsy, it's dangerous work. So there's different things that you can do bending the wrong way uh, that I'm not going to say is unavoidable, but things happen in that profession that you can't, you know, sometimes you have to duck just a two by four coming at you. Okay. Uh, on your, you know, when you're doing flooring, your knees, so luckily drumming is not that hazardous for your health, but all of my injuries that I've had have come from doing that kind of work and not from drumming. All right. So those of you who do those kinds of things, I know there's a lot of you who are woodworkers and play a lot of sports. You might think an injury is coming from drumming when it really came from that, or maybe sleeping bad on your arm or your neck. If it's really bad, you need to go see a doctor, get it figured out. But one thing I'm going to say right now, before we go on, is uh, talk about surgery, okay? Lots of people get surgery. And I think a lot of these surgeries are unnecessary, personally. I've had pretty bad injuries from, like I said, doing carpentry and leg things and arm things and rotator cuff, both of them I've torn, from doing, again, uh, building houses and doing that stuff. But I never got surgery for them. I've had them diagnosed, so I know what the hell was wrong with me which is great. And all the doctors always recommend, oh, we can fix this easy. But you know, I feel like once they cut you, once you get cut and you're doing drumming, which uses such fine muscles, 
then there could be problems. And if there's any chance of there being a problem, you want to avoid it. Okay, so that's my take on it. I'm sure I'll get some hate mail from that, but I try to avoid surgery. And you know, your body is an amazing organism. It will heal. Every injury that I've ever had has healed. Now, some of them have taken a while. Those rotator cuff things took almost a year to per heal perfectly where I had full flexibility again. And when I was playing a fast, you know, jazz gig, I felt completely normal. So it did take a while, but you know, I dealt with the pain and, um, you just play and it gets better rather than have surgery and, and risking something, you know, something going wrong because doctors, just like all people, they're fallible. They can make mistakes. You can get great doctors like musicians or you can get bad doctors. So uh, if you're lucky enough to have had surgery and it was successful, I'm so happy for you. But try to avoid it unless it's absolutely necessary. Now, doctors will want to do surgery for everything. They want to do it for carpal tunnel. They want to do it for neck stuff, back stuff knee stuff and sometimes it's absolutely necessary i mean if you're if you if your hands are numb 24 7 by all means get that carpal tunnel surgery okay but a lot of drummers have carpal tunnel and if you don't know what that is it's a um uh, strangling i'll say of that nerve right in here the carpal tunnel nerve that happens from overuse waiters get it people who work on computers get it pianists get it and drummers get it i remember mel lewis had it I used to go see him in New York and he wasn't playing. I'm like, I think Joey Barron was playing. It's like, why is Mel not playing? And uh, I found out that Mel had carpal tunnel syndrome, which I was shocked because he's a jazz drummer. Well, you play enough, you're gonna probably get it. And I've had a little of it in both hands from playing a lot, but I just uh, take some time off. I ice it, I massage it. You know, sometimes I'll go to a chiropractor, I'll get acupuncture, that helps a little. Things like that. Uh, I take a lot of vitamin B12 and eat foods like that. That helps too. But uh, every time I go, I'll get it checked every five years. They'll do a nerve test and they'll look at it and say, you know, we can, we should do some surgery on that. We can fix it. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do it. And I'm fine. I feel great when I play. And if it starts acting up, I just take a few days off and um, it's better. So, and I, you know, it happens almost with all musicians, guitar players, like I said, piano players, conductors get it. All right, so it's a common thing and it's really not avoidable if you play as much as most musicians. It's just not, no matter what you do, no matter how correct you play, you're probably gonna deal with something like that. Now, another issue you can get dealing with that area, you can get some cysts that happen. I've never had that. They can happen on top or the bottom and it's kind of like a scar tissue, so it's a tearing and mainly that happens with drummers who play like this and they're leaving the stick on the head like that. I've uh, helped I a lot of professional musicians, drummers who've come to me with this kind of problem. They're really sore in here. And then I watch them play and they're literally leaving the stick on the head, dead stroking all the time. And you know, you do that a few times, no problem. You do it a thousand times, you're going to have a problem. Okay. With that, that's just nature. So just by hitting. So what you always want to do, and I've said this in all of my videos, is bounce. Let the stick bounce. As soon as you start doing this, you're hammering nails, okay? So uh, you're going to create problem, little micro tears in your muscles, your tendons. Over time, that creates scar tissue, and over time, that limits your flexibility. So you should all be able to do that, okay? I know some of you, when I've shown you this, you, you email me, you say, how the hell do you do that? I can't even move my wrist past here. Well, you probably have some scar tissue in there in your left hand from something. If you can't do that, which is a natural motion, then uh, you, know, you might wanna try to do some hand exercises <laughs> or some yoga, but, or you could just have some scar tissue. So that might not happen for you, okay? So those kinds of things come from playing too hard and leaving the stick on the drum where you need to play off the drum all right now the next common problem besides the wrist that happens is a forearm or tennis elbow problem which is an epidemic pretty much with drummers a lot of them say oh man it hurts so bad now that comes again from being too tense when you play if you're doing this with your arm when you play all the time, 
all of that vibration, because there is vibration, no matter what sticks you use, goes up your arm and goes there. You'll notice if you look at a physiology diagram that all these muscles, there's not a lot of muscles in your hand. You got this one and a few others, but most of them are here in your forearms. And over time, you'll develop a big muscle there. It's kind of like, I call it the Popeye muscle, okay, which will fill out and support all of these tendons in your wrist. And then that will help you avoid getting that tennis elbow. Now that tennis elbow can become really chronic where you have trouble even opening a door, okay, and doing things like that. And a lot of marimba players get it. Again, marimba is an instrument because you're using four mallets that you can get lots of problems with your, with your hands because it's so unnatural and you just have to learn and beef up your arms. But if you practice too much before you're strong enough, you can have these problems. So that elbow, again, is important. Now, you can do certain things to avoid that. One thing I'd recommend is you can take some very light weights, very light, like one or two pounds, and do this kind of motion with them. Okay, don't do it with a five pound barbell. All right, you're going to hurt yourself. But stabilize your arm on a table and just do that a bunch of times. There's also hand grips. Don't use the heaviest ones that work well. And I've used those. There's also these things called therabands that, that you turn like this that I think are great. And I do not endorse a company or anything like that. But I use those too. And I'll do this with them. And you can also bend them. I'll put a picture up on um, on here so you can see what they are. And they're cheap. And they're just pieces of rubber that you twist. So all this will exercise that motion. You see it working there. Okay. So those are things you can do to strengthen. But the best thing you can do is just to drum and drum correctly. So again, working on rudiments, just paradiddles. And you see the way there that I throw the stick. So the whole idea is to play with power, but let that stick bounce. Now you can also use a heavier stick to warm up like I do. I've done videos on this and I always say that I make a heavier stick. That's the same diameter that I use to warm up. And I play a lot of my snare drumming with that stick. I like a heavier stick. But if you start using a heavier stick and you've been using a light stick and you start practicing three or four hours a day, you're going to have problems. All right, you're not going to go out and try to lift 500 pounds if you can only lift 100. All right, you're going to hurt your back. So it just makes sense. Just logic, common sense. All right, so a heavier stick, you got to build up to that. It will give you a bigger sound, uh, even when you play soft, and it will bounce more. So, you know, for double stroke rolls. And things like this. You have that weight on the stick that lets you bounce, okay? So that's something you might want to do. But again, if you start using a heavier stick, don't do it for an hour a day. Just start with five minutes a day, then 10 minutes, then 20 minutes. Eventually, like I said, you'll get strong and build that up. The shoulder is a pretty amazing little device. It's kind of like your knees. There's a lot of things that can go wrong with it. It has to remain flexible throughout your lifetime. So you can do all that stuff. And for drumming, it's so, so important. You're raising your arm up to play the ride a lot of times, okay? So that support has to be there. If you have a problem with this, then you're going to be in trouble. You're not going to be able to play a lot of things, all right? Now, one of the things that I see often, and we're going to talk about this more when I do the drum set version of this video, is that players have their equipment set up uh, in not a good way. OK, so they'll have to reach out their arm way to reach a symbol or their or, you know, the toms will have like a bunch of toms all over the place and they'll have to move like this. And that that's not good. You know, the best thing is start simple. All right. Sit down. So your legs are parallel like you're sitting in a chair, wherever your feet are planted. That's where your height goes. That's where your bass drum goes. Number one, then set up your toms so it's natural. So when you're moving, you're moving like this, not lunging or stretching. Same thing with cymbals. You should be able to just throw out your arms and hit a cymbal. Now, that's not always practical. I know a lot of you like to use really large kits, and that's totally fine. 
I mean, if you're using like a Neil Peart setup, you're going to have to do some getting around. It's a lot of drums, all right? But make sure no matter what you're doing is you're setting up in an ergonomic way so you're not, you know, trying to realistically use your shoulders to do that. It, you need to move like this rather than that. And I've had students, lots of students, when I see them on video or do a Skype lesson, I just cannot believe the drum setups and the way they have their drum set up. Their cymbal might be way up here. That's ridiculous. Have your cymbal low enough so you're just doing this, okay? Not this. Your arm shouldn't be raised all the time. If it is, you won't last too long. Now, when you first start playing and you start playing Latin stuff and you're using the bell, your, arm, your shoulder might get a little sore. That's natural. I remember when I was a kid, I was trying to play all this, you know, this Latin stuff. And I was like, why does my arm hurt so bad? Well, it's because I was playing on the bell of the cymbal so much. And I would normally play on the regular body of the cymbal. So I was all of a sudden stretched out more. So what I did was I bought an 18 inch cymbal with a bell and I learned on that. So it didn't hurt. And then years later, as I got bigger and stronger, never became a problem. I don't even think about it anymore. But I do have students who tell me, oh man, my shoulder hurts. Well, that's why. So one remedy is you can take a smaller cymbal and practice with that so you're closer, so you're not stretching out your arm until you get strong enough and then, you know, put the big cymbal up. It's like training wheels, okay? Start little, get bigger, and then you'll be safe there. Now, in the left hand, if you're playing traditional, the worst thing you can do is move like this. I see lots of people doing that. You've got to move like this. So you see how that comes in, you can call that the Muller technique or whatever you want to call it. It's like a whip stroke. You never want to move like this. It creates problems with your shoulder. Using your shoulders correctly looks like this. Not this. Okay? You can go much faster that way. Paradiddles are a really good exercise. Now to work on these things that I've been talking about, the wrist, the forearm, the shoulder, you need to work on some rudiments, okay? That's what will help you. Books like my Three Camps book work great because it's just redundancy, you know? And then you do that in paradiddles. Rademacuse. I mean, all the rudiments. So by repeating things over and over, slowly, okay, and then building up speed, you create strength. And with that strength comes the, you know, uh, the, you're strong enough so you won't hurt yourself. All right? Endurance is what I like to call it. Uh, any of the technique books, the Morello books are great. The old Wilcoxon books, uh, Finger and Wrist Control, Stick Control by George Stone, that's great. Anything that's going to get your hands moving but you've got to do them relax. And I have hundreds, literally, hundreds of videos here on YouTube about just that. So you know I'm serious. About all kinds of technique, hand technique, I mean, you name it. Brushes, everything, drum set stuff. So it's all on there, you gotta, you gotta look, look at it. If you look at my hand technique playlist, I talk a lot about these kinds of things. That would help you a lot, all right? So, just to go over it again, we have the wrists, we have the forearm, and this, Nerve here, your elbow, all right, like the tennis elbow thing, all right, the tendon. Then we have your shoulders. So those are all things you have to keep healthy. And we fix that by playing relaxed. The same goes for your neck, all right? If you're playing like this up, a lot of people play that way, you're going to have problems with your neck. That takes an incredible amount of tension uh, in, your, in your head, neck. You might even get headaches. I've had students who get headaches, all right? Also, your upper spine can start to deteriorate. Uh, it's going to deteriorate anyway as you get older. Everybody's spine deteriorates as they get older. Hopefully, though, it's not painful. That's what you want to avoid, mobility, the ability to move, all right? So that kind of hunching needs to be avoided. There's a simple exercise I show my students. I call it a reset. So basically, you take your arms, you put them at your sides, and you take a deep breath, and you just put your neck down. And you just hold it for 20 seconds. And whenever you feel tension, you do that. And when I'm first starting to teach a student, I have them do it all the time. Who's a student who's tense, so most of them are tense when I when I first encounter them. 
So I'll have them do that, and then they pick up the sticks and start again. And that feeling that you get when your arms are down, your neck's down, not, not extended, but just relaxed like you're sleeping. And then pick up the sticks and play. That's the feeling you want all the time, 24-7, when you're playing the drums. And if you can reach that, it's kind of nirvana, you know? You're always playing, you're always relaxed. And then drumming feels great. Like when I play, it feels great. I mean, it's like I just can't wait to get a pair of sticks in my hands, okay? I might be having the worst day or just my body feels like crap. And then I start playing and I warm up and all of a sudden I feel great. Everything feels better. So that's what you want. That's how you want to get it, all right? It's, it's really natural. It's making something unnatural like drumming natural. So finally, I'd like to talk about your fingers. So this is uh, extremely important. If you use your fingers a lot, it takes away a lot of the effort you have to use for your wrists, your arms, and your shoulders. Uh, finger control is a huge topic. I've done a lot of videos on this. Uh, there's several books I recommend, uh, as well as exercises. Uh, you can look at my video. Uh, I think it's called uh, Rick's, Rick's Chop Builders. And there's 36 uh, exercises that are in both my books that you can use to develop your wrists and fingers. Other books would include uh, the Wilcoxon book, Wrist and Finger Control, that I mentioned earlier. Stick Control, Accents and Rebounds by George Stone and the Morello books are great for developing finger technique. So with your fingers, you want to use these back fingers here, these three to support the stick, and the grip is here with the thumb and the first finger, as most of you know. Now this muscle here, I call it the fulcrum muscle, okay? That will get big and strong, and over time, your stick will stop corkscrewing up and down because of the balance that you have with your fingers and your grip, like this. And traditional, I've shown you on videos how I work on that with just my thumb or just my forearm and my fingers over. So there's different ways to work on your fingers. So you can watch those videos. But you want to use a lot of fingers when you play. Uh, it's so important when you play doubles. You see there how I'm bouncing, uh, and then also I'm using my wrist then for the accents. So I have this bounce going, but then I'm using a separate part of my hands to do that. So that is kind of an ergonomic way to play. You use different muscle groups uh, for different things. For accents, you can use your wrists, your fingers, like a clinch, or a whip stroke. Okay, and I have a separate video on playing accents too you can look at. There's four kinds of accents that, that I use. So that kind of wraps it up with, uh, with pretty much all the parts of your body that can you know, go wrong when you're playing. There's one more thing that I do want to talk about though. It's what you're playing on. So you should always try to use some sort of pad or obviously a drum with a real head, a real drum head, which is what you're going to be playing on. So you guys know I use these old quiet tone drum mutes. Uh, Sabian makes a version now, which is good. Uh, Remo makes a pad with a real head. Uh, a few other manufacturers do too. I recommend using those. Don't use um, a pad that's like mesh. That will that will mess you up. I, I've done a couple church gigs on some electronic drums. I won't name the manufacturer. They use these mesh heads. And the next day, literally, I've had problems with my elbows. And then I thought, oh, maybe I did something else. But then a couple weeks later, I'll go back and play them. And it's the same thing. So that's what it is. It, they just respond funny, you know. And uh, for me anyway, and I've had several of my students who play in churches with electronic drum kits talk to me about it too. Uh, those things will also sand your sticks down, those heads, which is a little bit scary. So avoid anything mesh. Rubber is okay. It's obviously quiet, but you're not going to be playing gigs on a rubber pad. So you probably don't want to practice too much on that. You can play on real feels and all that, that's fine. Um, but again, I like something like I've said on many videos with a real head. And I think it's, you know, what you're gonna be playing on, so you should practice on that, all right? So hopefully I covered everything. I'm sure I'll get some emails and comments, and please, I love getting those. And, um, you know, I try to answer as many of them as I can. And uh, just send them on along, and I hope this helps with the health of your body. And your hands and then I will do another one at a later date on drum set and your feet and how to sit and posture and all that so stay well and stay healthy thanks